ahead and do your introductions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bennett. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Renato, and I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Murilo Zerbini. So he was my professor at UFV in Brazil, and he has a bachelor's degree in agronomy, a master's in plant pathology from Universidade Federal de Viçosa in Brazil, and a PhD also in plant pathology, but from the University of California, Davis. He has been a professor at the Department of Plant Pathology at UFV since 1996, and his main research interests are ecology and evolution of Gemini viruses. Uh, Dr. Murillo was the editor-in-chief of Tropical Plant Pathology between 2000, 2012 and 2017, and associate editor of Annals of Applied Biology, Archives of Virology, Journal of General Virology, Plant Pathology, and Virology. And currently, he is the president of the International Committee on Virus Taxonomy, also called ICTV. So today, uh, he will be talking about the recent developments in virus taxonomy from metagenomics and megataxonomy. So thank you for agreeing to be part of the seminar today. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Renata. Uh, it's a nice introduction. It's great to see you. Actually, I see lots of familiar uh, faces and names here. It's, it's, uh, I, was, I was just remembering, uh, it was almost exactly two years ago that I gave a seminar for you guys uh, on my own work, on my work in Germany viruses. And it was amazing. I think it was like the, my first online seminar at the time. It was very weird. It felt very strange. I remember I was in my office and it was difficult to get into the atmosphere of giving a talk. And then when it was over, just you just disconnect and you're back in your lab. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, and <laughs> little did we know, right? So now it's now I'm home. I'm at home, so relaxed, and this is just normal. It's like my fourth meeting today. And oh well, uh, I I wish I could be there <laughs> in person and, and 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 talking to everybody. But I guess this is our new. Uh, 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 way of doing things and we're probably going to continue to do this uh, things like this for a while even after we can you know uh, go back to uh, in-person meetings and everything I, I think this came to stay it has its advantages but uh, I don't know so I'm, I'm sharing my screen here I hope everybody can see it uh, so as I said this is this is the second time I, I, I give a seminar here which I I guess it's a good thing. Maybe you guys liked the first one and <laughs> decided to invite me again. I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, well, uh, the topic today is rather different. Uh, and uh, as I've already said here, I, I, I'll try my best to make this interesting. I know everybody, I mean, I, I know most people don't, they don't get terribly excited about taxonomy in general. Uh, but this is a, a topic in which I've been involved for, for many years now. And I, 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 I like it. <laughs> I, I, I think it's an important thing it's, it, it, when it's well done and it helps uh, uh, scientists to communicate with each other. So it's important that it's well done. Uh, so I like, I, I like taxonomy. I like being involved in taxonomy and I like talking about taxonomy. So uh, hopefully you will be entertained today. Okay. Uh, as, as Renata said, uh, I, I'm the current president of the ICTV since October of last year, and that lasts for three years. Um, but so uh, just, just from the start, let me make something clear. Uh, if, you, if you ask me, I'm going to tell you, no, I'm not a taxonomist. Okay. And I think everybody who's involved in virus taxonomy is going to say the same thing. We're, no, 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 I'm not a taxonomist. I'm a virologist. I, I happen to work on taxonomy, but my main job is, is virology, right? And everybody I know, everybody I've worked with and interacted during my years at the ICTV is definitely a virologist first. They have research programs in virology. Some of them are retired. Some of them are active. But everybody will, will describe him or herself as a virologist. But yeah, we have this, this alternative uh, life uh, as a taxonomist. 
And I, I like this cartoon first because it betrays my age, right? Everybody who lived through the 90s know the, knows the far side. I also like it because uh, there, are, there are some parallels between the life of a musician and the life of a taxonomist probably. I, there was a time in my life when I entertained the idea of maybe going becoming a musician. And well, you know, you work at nights and weekends you don't make any money and everybody criticizes you all the time. So <laughs> there's definitely a similarity. Uh, but yeah, the, the point here is this, and, and I'm sure it's also true for, for mycologists, bacteriologists, nematologists uh, who work on taxonomy in their respective fields, uh, and, and even botanists and zoologists. So taxonomy is the work, virus taxonomy is definitely the work of virologists. You don't make a career out of taxonomy. Right? You make a career out of virology. Uh, just, um, I'm gonna give a quick, very quick introduction on the ICTV, uh, how it was created and where, how it's, it's, it's structured, uh, but that's, that's quick. Uh, and I like to start by this quote from a previous uh, ICTV president and an outstanding virologist, Frank Fenner. He was the second president of the ICTV and in this picture, he's actually addressing the WHO assembly to communicate the eradication of smallpox. So no small achievement. Uh, as I said, he was a great virologist. So uh, he had this wonderful quote, the taxonomy lies in the uneasy interface between biology and logic. And our job is to reconcile these two disciplines as, as well as possible. He has a second quote that I like a lot is that taxa are often built on relationships that we would like to believe from an evolutionary standpoint, but are unable to prove. Now, this quote is from 1976. And I'm highlighting this last part in red because I think today uh, we are actually able to prove it a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times. And one of the objectives of my talk today is to convince you that, yeah, today we can prove that. Uh, very convincingly. Okay, so of course he was right in 1976, uh, and if if he was alive today, uh, I hope he would agree with me as well. Uh, so it's been a long uh, tax, virus taxonomy has come a long way since then, of course. So I often get asked this question: Why do you work on taxonomy? Uh, what's the attraction? Right. Well, I guess it's a human compulsion, actually, for some people, not for everybody. Right? But for some, and definitely for me. And I like to use this, this analogy. This is your life without taxonomy. And this is your life with good taxonomy. Okay, which one do you prefer? I, I definitely prefer the one at the right. Uh, now, of course, I mean good taxonomy, right? Because bad taxonomy is almost as bad as no taxonomy, right? Uh, I, uh, I'm sure that my colleagues are familiar with that t-shirt that says bad taxonomy kills and has the image of one of those poisonous fungi. And if you confuse it with the, the good ones, you know, so bad taxonomy is, is not good. Uh, and so of course you need to do taxonomy right. But if you do it right, as I uh, seriously now, it, it greatly facilitates scientific communication, right? That's one thing. Uh, it helps you to infer the properties of new viruses that you discover, if you can quickly correlate that, quickly associate that virus with known viruses, with known properties, uh, and helps you to understand the evolutionary relationships among organisms. So taxonomy is pretty important, actually, right? But it, it has this very important role in terms of science communication, it helps us to communicate things, right? So I'm gonna go quickly through the history of virus taxonomy. And the first attempts of a, a taxonomy system for viruses date from the 1920s and 30s, when all we knew about viruses really were their biological properties. Even before uh, uh, we knew what the virus actually was, uh, there was already attempts at, at, at classifying viruses. There was a first system uh, uh, published in 1935 with descriptive keys uh, based on five uh, uh, biological properties. And using these keys, Johnson and Hogan classified 50 viruses into groups. Now, it didn't work. Uh, it didn't work because, uh, uh, of course, with the precarious knowledge that we had on virus properties at the time, 
some of these uh, criteria were greatly inadequate to establish relationships among viruses, like symptoms, right? Every virus induces mosaic, maybe not every virus, but so many viruses induce mosaic. So that's definitely not a good criteria for taxonomy. So, you know, it was a first attempt, uh, but it didn't work and it was not adopted, right? Uh, over the 1950s and 60s, virology advanced a lot. And now we knew what the viruses were. We could see them in the electron microscope. And that was when serology uh, started to become more widespread, more common. And, and serology was very helpful to establish relationships among viruses. So there, was, there were more attempts, uh, many different attempts actually at, at, at uh, establishing a good taxonomy system for viruses. And I mentioned in one, uh, uh, this one from 1959, and I mentioned it more because of the nomenclature aspect than, than the classification aspect. And what's relevant here is that this was the first time that someone actually proposed an English nomenclature for, for viruses, as opposed to a binomial Latin system that's used for all the other organisms. And as you may imagine, it was very controversial at the time, especially among non-English speakers. Uh, but in the end, it was adopted. Uh, uh, and that's what we were using until last year. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So that's why I, I, I point out this one. But the truth is that even at this time, uh, people could not agree on what the correct criteria were and whether we actually even could do virus taxonomy at that time. So even though many systems were proposed, none was officially or even unofficially adopted. It was very chaotic, actually, very uh, a lot of lot of heated discussions. It's funny because so many people say that they don't like taxonomy, don't they don't want to get interested in taxonomy, but taxonomy at the same time uh, uh, generates very heated arguments among people in, in every field. So in 1966. Uh, in the International Congress of Microbiology. Finally, it, it was decided that uh, an international committee on nomenclature of viruses was gonna be created. Now, the initial idea was to name this committee, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses, but there was so, so much disagreement that the compromise that they reached was to call it the International Committee on Nomenclature of Viruses. Because as I said, so many people thought that we simply didn't know enough about viruses to actually do taxonomy. But well, yeah, we can do nomenclature, right? But anyway, uh, it, was, it was a compromise. Now, incredibly, uh, the structure that was agreed at the time still holds. And that's why I, I, I mentioned here, the ICTV still has an executive committee, which is the top level of, of decision-making. Uh, and then you have subcommittees, and, and I'm gonna show which ones in a minute. And then you have study groups uh, uh, for specific virus groups or genera or families. Uh, you can have study groups at different levels. Uh, so that structure still holds, it's, it, it's still organized like that. Uh, one of the most important jobs of the ICTV is to publish reports, periodic reports. The first one was published in 1971, still as the ICMV. And in this first report, a small number of families and genera were, were described. Uh, in 73, it, finally the name was changed to the ICTV, which is still the name. And it has been published in reports periodically. The last print report was published in 2012. Today, the report is online. So if today the, the ICTV has a very significant web presence that we have a website where you can find the links to the ICTV report. Uh, today, it's, a, it's an online free resource. Uh, you can access for free. The previous reports were published as books. Uh, you had to buy the books, they were pretty expensive. And, but they, they started to get so large that it was, you know, you couldn't do a print book anymore. And then we got a grant from the uh, Wellcome Trust from the UK, and that managed us to publish the reports online as a, as a free resource. So you can, you, you, there is a link here for the ICTV report. And, and when you access the ICTV webpage, you, you have this figure here with the covers of all the previous reports. So uh, as I was mentioning, the structure of the ICTV is still the same as devised in 1966 with an executive committee that today has 23 virologists from 13 countries, uh, seven uh, uh, subcommittees, 
animal DNA viruses, DS minus strain ssRNA, plus strain ssRNA, RPO, bacterial, fungal, and plant viruses. Uh, each one has a number of study groups. These study groups have anything between five or 20 people working on them, all voluntary. I mean, in fact, everybody here works voluntarily, right? Uh, there are also life members, 10 virologists, there are life members and national representatives. So there's about 600 people involved here, uh, in, in the work of the SCTV. And as I said, everybody works voluntarily, <laughs> usually at nights on weekends when we have, that's when we have time from our regular uh, jobs, right? So uh, the ICTV, the executive committee of the ICTV meets once a year. Uh, here it's just the last, the last three meetings. Of course, last year's was online. And as you can see here, there's a pretty large number of taxonomy proposals that are discussed and approved or, or, or rejected at these meetings. Uh, these proposals are prepared usually by the study groups, but in fact, anyone can prepare a taxonomy proposal and submit it to the ICTV. Uh, if you access the site, you will see the templates for to prepare these taxonomy proposals. Uh, and, and, and then they are uh, discussed at the online, at, at the executive committee meeting. Uh, most of the proposals tend to be approved. Uh, there is a very uh, systematic process to, to approve these proposals. I'm not gonna get into that here. Eventually a proposal is rejected, but usually if they're gonna be rejected, they're rejected even before the ICTV meeting. They don't even make it to the meeting. Uh, so the, we, we published regular updates, uh, yearly updates on the taxonomy, usually in the form of a, a paper published in Archives of Virology. So there's one, usually one every year uh, detailing the current changes. The website, the taxonomy at the website is updated once a year as well. And it's, it's about to be updated any, any day now. It's going to be updated with the results of last year's meeting. Uh, also the study groups, can publish the regular updates on the taxonomy of their particular uh, groups of viruses. One example here, the VD virus study group published this update in 2020. Sometimes uh, uh, groups of virology, uh, virologists published uh, other updates or, or even discussion papers dealing with the specific aspects of taxonomy of their groups of viruses. And sometimes the ICTV itself, the executive committee itself publishes discussion papers or, or communications of relevant decisions regarding virus taxonomy like this one here. So this is a, just a few examples, okay? So uh, this is more or less very quickly, very briefly, how the ICTV works. So uh, I wanna mention four aspects for recent develops, developments here in this talk. Uh, first is the classification of viruses from metagenomics studies, uh, which is already approved, is something that's already happening. The creation of upper taxonomy ranks, which we nicknamed the mega taxonomy. The fact that taxa can all be named after people, I'm just gonna mention this very quickly. And I'm gonna finish with the issue of the linear nomenclature for virus species, which was something that was incredibly controversial and, and, and I'm gonna make the, I'm gonna keep it until the end of the talk to tell you whether if it was approved or not. And again, everything today is, you, you can find all this information in the ICTV website. So uh, I'm gonna start with the metagenomics based taxonomy. And just to give you an idea, we currently have this number of virus species recognized by the ICTV. And it might seem like a large number, right? But honestly, it's, it's not, right? Now, the absolute majority of these species are pathogens. Uh, I would like to say all of them, but it's, it's really not all of them, but it's like 95% of them are pathogens of human or rubber cultural interest. Because historically, these were the viruses that we studied, right? It's only very recent that it started to become clear that in fact, many, many viruses are not pathogens, right? This is a recent idea. And with the publication of the first metagenomics studies, 
this concept of the viral dark matter was was uh, uh, proposed, right? And that's because in this early metagenomics studies, the absolute majority of the sequence uh, uh, reads, people could not functionally annotate them with, with viral, I mean, viral reads, right? Uh, either functionally or taxonomically. Uh, in some studies, 90% of the viral reads, as much as you could tell that they were viruses, they could not be uh, classified or, or even functionally annotated. So it quickly became very clear that those 6,590 species, they're just the very, very, very tip of a very large iceberg of viral diversity. And these metagenomic studies were instrumental in making us understand the scale of the unknown uh, uh, virus sphere. And, you know, with all these viruses out there, what do you do with them in terms of classification, right? So just, just two examples here in terms of how these metagenomic studies changed our, our understanding of the, of the virus sphere. This first incredibly fantastic paper published in 2016, uh, in which the authors studied RNA viruses in invertebrates. Uh, and just, you know, they sampled pretty much every group of invertebrates, uh, uh, terrestrial or aquatic. And just one simple figure gives you the idea of, of what they discover. In these in this phylogenetic trees uh, arranged by different groups of viruses, everything that is in red was a new virus discovered in this study. Okay, and, and these are the ones that they could classify, <laughs> right? Uh, because there were many that, as, as mentioned before, could not be uh, classified. So in this one study, they uh, now analyzed the transcriptomes of 220 species of invertebrates. They sequenced more than 6 trillion nucleotides, and they discovered almost 1,500 new RNA viruses, including many that were very divergent to the point of being classified as new families. Now, besides virus discovery by itself, uh, it was incredible because this, this work filled incredible gaps in, in RNA virus phylogeny. And that's when it started to become more uh, uh, feasible to actually establish those evolutionary relationships that, that Frank Fenner could not establish back in the, in, in the 1970s when these gaps started to be filled. So this metagenomic studies, as I said, besides the virus discovery aspect, which is interesting enough. They were also, you know, uh, I like to say before these studies, uh, the virus diversity was like a 1,000 piece uh, uh, puzzle. Uh, and we only had maybe 50 pieces. With these metagenomic studies, maybe we got 500 pieces. There's still gaps, of course, uh, but many of these gaps were filled with these studies. Uh, the same group published another paper a couple of years later, now dealing with vertebrate RNA viruses. And what was interesting here with these vertebrate viruses is that they, again, they found many new viruses, the ones in red here, represented in red, but with um, mammals and, and birds, no new viruses, because these two groups of organisms had been already extremely well sampled, because these are the viruses that interest us, right? So here, the, 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 the scheme here is different. Here, new viruses are indicated by these uh, uh, circles, okay? And everything that's in red here are mammals. So as you can see, no, red cir no, no circles in the, in the red phylogeny, phylogenetic trees, right? But they found many, many new viruses in, in fish, and in amphibia, and in, in reptiles, okay? So again, an increase in our knowledge of new viruses, so uh, similar numbers here, okay? But uh, only 214 new viruses associated with reptiles, amphibian fish, with no new viruses discovered in birds and mammals. This is another uh, uh, paper that uh, uh, summarized the new knowledge in terms of single-stranded DNA viruses thanks to metagenomics. This is what was known before uh, uh, metagenomics, okay? A couple groups of viruses that infect animals, and two groups of our two families of viruses that infect plants. And this is what was discovered in metagenomics: seven major new groups of uh, single-stranded DNA viruses. 
probably easier to visualize as a tree in which the colored groups here are what was known before the metagenomics studies and everything that was discovered uh, thanks to metagenomics. So again, an incredible increase in the known diversity. Now, as I said before, as taxonomists, we have to decide whether we're going to ignore all these new viruses or are we going to classify them? And, and a lot of people will tell you, no, you should not classify this because these are just sequences, right? Uh, you don't know the host, you, you don't have an actual isolate. How are, how are we going to classify a sequence, right? But, well, we, the, 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 this whole thing started to become very, very, uh, uh, we, we needed to do something as a committee on taxonomy, right? So in 2016, there was a workshop that was organized by the ICTV with funding from the Wellcome Trust, in which we had 13 EC members, I was there, and 13 invited experts on, on metagenomics. It, it to, they, they gave talks and explained what they had found in terms of virus diversity. And it was a two-day workshop. On the first day, we had the talks by the invited experts. And on the second day, we just had the breakout groups and, and discussions on whether we had enough data and we had enough confidence in these in these sequences to be able to classify them and to make a very long story short yes we decided that they could be classified uh, we the, the ictv then published this this uh, 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 consensus statement uh, already communicating the decision that yes we would accept uh, species and genera and families based on sequence data alone in the absence of any biological information, as long as some quality criteria were satisfied. And I'm not gonna get into this level of detail here, but yeah, we, we accepted that if these criteria, criteria were satisfied, we could classify these things, okay? And uh, there is sort of a, uh, well, to put it politely, there is a, uh, generational divide here okay the older virologists tend to think that this is crazy basically <laughs> right how can you classify a sequence right but the younger people they realize that you can infer biological information from a sequence which is absolutely true right uh, so this is part of the, the the text of this paper that only by accepting that yes sequences that are generated by metagenomic methods truly represent existing viruses. That's how we can really understand the ecology, history, and impact of this global viral. So this is this was published in 2017. It's been almost four years now. And we already have at least a few families that were created, that were accepted by the ICTV, entirely based on metagenomics data. And that's just one example, the genome of URD which is a family of viruses, as you can see from the tree, very large, there's, I think, 174 species now. And it was defined ex exclusively on the basis of metagenomics. We don't know what the hosts of these viruses are. Uh, they could be invertebrates, fungi, or plants. Some of them have been isolated from plants. Some have been isolated from fungi. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll take it back, sorry. They have not been isolated from plants or fungi. They were uh, sequenced from metagenomic studies in which plants and fungi were, were uh, sampled, okay? Uh, so we don't really know the hosts. Not a single one of these viruses has had its host properly identified. But the sequences pass those criteria, those quality criteria that I mentioned. So the family was created, it was accepted, and now it's a bona fide uh, a family of viruses. And there are other examples. That's the only one that I'm going to mention. Okay. So today, uh, uh, to finish this part, you can create species, genera, families, and other taxa based on sequence alone, as long as the sequence is uh, uh, correct and you can provide those quality criteria. Uh, as as a consequence of the advances in metagenomics, as I mentioned before, we started to fill those gaps in the phylogenies and, and the evolutionary relationships between viruses started to become more and more clear. So at some point, we, uh, we decided that maybe we could already establish relationships that 
between viruses at the higher levels, because until 2018, you had species, genera, families, and orders of viruses. And that was it. The higher taxa didn't exist in virus taxonomy because up until that time, you simply could not establish the relationships above the, the, the level of order. Uh, but with this, these advances that I was mentioning, we felt that maybe it was time that we could try to establish these relationships. And that's what this work uh, uh, that I'm showing here uh, uh, described. So in this work, we used uh, six what we called viral hallmark genes. And this was a concept that was uh, uh, proposed by Eugene Kooning. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the work, the incredible work of, of Eugene Kooning and, and Valerian Dolja as well, a great plant virologist that now works on virus evolution as well. So uh, they proposed this concept of viral hallmark genes, which are genes that are common across a very large group of otherwise diverse viruses, right? And as I said, there were six hallmark genes here that we identified, and that's uh, uh, coat proteins of the double jelly roll type, roller circle replication uh, uh, you know, proteins with SSDNA viruses, single, rel single jelly roll coat proteins, supergroup two helicases, RNA helicases, uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerases and reverse transcriptases. So, uh, again, not getting into the finest detail here, uh, it was shown that you could do a phylogeny of our DRPs, and, and this phylogeny could reconstruct the evolutionary history of RNA viruses. Now, it's, it's a difficult phylogeny, and it's not without criticism, but we believe it's, it's true, it's robust. And in many cases, we have biological data to support this phylogeny. It's not just out of the, it's, just, it's not just sequences. Many of these viruses have been extremely well characterized in terms of biological properties. So this phylogeny actually reflects biology. Uh, likewise, with reverse transcriptases, you can reconstruct a good phylogeny of reverse transcriptases. And then again, uh, put together the relationships between this very diverse group of viruses that includes plants, and, and, and animal viruses and even transposons. With other hallmark genes, it's not as easy and, and the phylogenies are not really very robust. So instead of actually doing traditional phylogenies, we did uh, gene network analysis. And in, with gene network analysis, you could actually, again, uh, group, uh, uh, establish very good, very solid groups of viruses and establish the relationships among them. And that's especially true in the case of those structural proteins, the double jelly roll capsid proteins uh, and the AK97 type uh, cold proteins as well. You could also establish uh, uh, some pretty strongly supported groups of viruses that share this, this hallmark gene and are related to each other. So in this study, we actually proposed four major groups of viruses that uh, in this particular uh, paper we didn't name, but eventually were named by the ICTV. The RNA viruses, all RNA viruses, and that includes the viruses with, uh, uh, that uh, express their genomes by reverse transcription, some of which have actually DNA genomes like colimoviruses, plant colimoviruses, but they are part of this group here. Single-stranded DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA viruses with double jelly roll capsid proteins and with HK97 capsid proteins. So these four groups of viruses were proposed as these very large groups uh, that eventually became named as realms. I'm just going to show this for the plant viruses, okay? So this was published in, in, in uh, the ICTV decided to accept that, uh, and this was published in 2019. I don't have it here, here but it's, yeah, it's, actually this paper is from 2020. When we went from that five rank structure that would go as high as order, and now it goes all the way class, film, kingdom, and realm. Uh, we spent quite some time actually discussing how to name this upper uh, uh, taxa. The most logical word would be domain but for various reasons, it was decided to call it a realm instead of a domain, okay? And just here for plant viruses, 
the structure as we have it today uh, for the RNA plant viruses, the realm ribovirea. We took kingdoms, one for the uh, uh, true RNA viruses that have our DRPs and for the reverse transcribing viruses, okay? So you have different phyla classes and the more familiar orders and families uh, that some of you will recognize. Virologists, of course, will recognize. So here's, here's Tombus viridae and, and uh, Rhabdoviridae, where's Rhabdoviridae, the negative, here's negative RNA, Rhabdoviridae is here. And of course, Poriviridae, uh, you know, the, the usual families of RNA viruses. But now you have all the different levels here, all the way to, to the realm level. And the same thing for the single-stranded DNA viruses. You have a realm called monodnaviria and of different phyla, classes, orders, and families. And here's the two families of plant viruses, okay? I'm not gonna show the other two because they don't have any plant viruses. So now we have a complete taxonomy. That's what we call the mega taxonomy, okay? With five realms, nine kingdoms, and so on until the 5,690 species. I, I got these numbers uh, two days ago. And as I said, anytime now, this is going to be updated with the proposals that were accepted in the 2020 C meeting. The number of realms remains five, uh, but in, in kingdom also, the remains five but we're gonna have one more film, a couple more classes and many, many new orders, families, genera and species. And of course, this being 2020, 21 with the pandemic, even the, the New York Times now gets interested in, in virus taxonomy and, and, and how the ICTV works. Although I have no idea where this guy got this number here. This number makes no sense. This is the correct number. But anyway, this, this article actually mentions the ICTV by name and, and a little bit of how it works and what it does. It was uh, pretty amazing to see this in the New York Times. Uh, as I mentioned to you as well, now we can name tax after people. Uh, this was not used, this, this was not allowed before with, with virus taxonomy. Of course, the mycologists and the bacteriologists do it all the time, right? But we didn't, and now we do. So now there is this Kitaviridae family named after Professor Kitajima, fellow Brazilian virologist, very very good, very great Brazilian virologists, virologist. The family Kiroviridae is in the order Martelli viralis, named after this, the Italian uh, uh, virologist that used to work on, on grape viruses. Unfortunately, this is uh, two years ago. And here's Mayo Viridae, also named after Mike Mayo. So now you can have, uh, and, and the person can be alive. The person does, doesn't have to, to be deceased. Professor Kitajima is still alive, uh, as long as the person agrees. Uh, and basically, the decision to allow naming tax after people is that so many new tax are being created that, especially with prokaryote viruses, viruses that infect bacteria, uh, it was a way of actually being able to devise names. Uh, it, it was getting to the point where people could not devise names anymore, and maybe using uh, uh, people, uh, it would be easier to devise new names. Now, uh, the last thing, the last topic I'm going to cover here uh is the naming of virus species okay and as i said this was incredibly controversial uh for for many reasons which i'm, I'm, I'm gonna mention here and just just so you realize this this is not something new this discussion has been going on for a while and five years ago uh, i mean not five years four and a half years ago uh, a very large group of people, myself included, we published this, this provocative article, uh, which we described as a thought experiment. Uh, can we devise Linnean binomial names for virus species if, if those were approved? And we took two uh, uh, virus uh, families here. Uh, and we saw if we could devise names. And it was so easy to come up with the names. It was amazing. Uh, I'm not going to show you, but yeah, we, it could be done. Uh, but that was five years ago. But of course, when I say Linnean binomials, what do I mean? I mean species names that are the same species names that you guys are familiar with, with fungi or bacteria or plants for that matter, right? Like Solanum lycopersicum, 
Solanum is the genus and Lycoperscum is the species epithet. Now, the known virologists are probably asking, well, I don't understand. Isn't this how you name virus species? No, it's not. Unlike all other types of all of the, all of all other all other taxonomies of all other other organisms, uh, virus taxonomy does, did not use Linnean binomials for species names, uh, which was, you know, most virologists were okay with that, but some virologists thought that was weird, and, and I was one of them, right? So. Again, the, the known virologists might think that this is a known issue, right? I mean, how come? It has to be binomial, right? No, it wasn't. And we actually had to spend a lot of time trying to convince virologists that we should use binomial nomenclature, right? So this, this next few slides are what I used to present at many different viro virology conferences and seminars and whatever when I was invited to talk about taxonomy to propose a binomial nomenclature for virus species. And I, I'm emphasizing virus species here. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. So just, you know, since its creation, the objectives of the ICTV was, were to develop not only a taxonomy system, but also to establish names for the taxa. So nomenclature is part, it's a big part of the ICTV, right? And in fact, in the first report, the very first one, published in 71, it's right there that an effort, it's, it's summarized there as a rule approved by the committee, that an effort will be made towards a Latinized binomial nomenclature. But words are easy, right? Uh, it, it never came to be actually for many reasons. All attempts failed. And there was a lot of resistance. And I have to say it mostly from the Anglosphere Right from from the English speaking world, the, the, the UK and the US, uh, at establishing a, a, a binomial nomenclature using Latin, like you have for other organisms. Uh, so the consequence of that is that we have no standard format for the names of virus species. Okay, and here's just a few examples: species names for viruses. Plant virologists will readily recognize here alfalfa mosaic virus. Okay, most plant viruses have standard names: host, symptom, virus. Okay, but if you go outside plant virology, it's really crazy. You have all types of things like alpha coronavirus one, the genus name and a number. Uh, Here's a plant virus that doesn't follow host symptom, right? Potato virus X, or just one word, Lausanne virus, which has a sort of a geographical. Well, anyway, the point is that there is no standard format, and these are all species names. Okay, so as a taxonomist, that bothers me incredibly. This is this is this is not good taxonomy, right? This is not a good system to have species names that have no standard format, right? So I was not the only one that thought that something should be done about that. A lot of people thought that something should be done about that. The problem was to agree on what to do. So the proposal that was formally made by a group of ICTV EC members, not the entire EC, but a group, was to use a binomial nomenclature system. This proposal was made in 2019. Why? Why did we propose a, biological, a binomial nomenclature? It, it must be obvious to the non-virologists in the audience, but, you know, well, it was consistent with all other biological taxonomies, right? All other organisms, insects, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, right? Uh, it makes obvious the difference between the virus name and the species name. And that, that's why I was emphasizing species name before, because that was a distinction that was almost impossible to make in virus taxonomy. People would mix the name of the virus with the name of species all the time. And what I mean by this is like, if you think about plants, tomato and solenolicopersicum, you have the plant name, and the species name, right? 
You don't plant solanum lycopersum. You plant tomatoes. You don't harvest solanum lycopersum. You harvest tomatoes. Tomato is a plant that's a member of the species solanum lycopersum. There's a very clear distinction. And when you use one word, tomato, and when you use the species name in a paper or in a thesis or in a, in a, in a talk, right? And because in many cases for the virus, the species name and the virus name was the same, people used to get it confused all the time. I would argue that 95% of the virologists couldn't use the correct virus name or species name in each situation. And that includes me. Uh, I used to get it wrong sometimes. Right. So by having a very clear binomial species name, it becomes immediately obvious when you're talking about the virus and when you're when you're talking about the species and you don't mix them anymore. Right. Of course, a species name written as a Latinized binomial would never be translated. Like people who still translate species names sometimes to their own languages. Right. So, for example, lettuce mosaic virus. That's a species name. So sometimes you see in the Portuguese literature, right? I work with these species and they translate the name. Now, if the species name becomes, for example, polyvirus like 2K, it will be obvious that this is a species name. You still have the virus lettuce mosaic virus, right? So this is the virus name. This would become the virus name. I mean, it would continue to be the virus name and this would be the species name, right? So they would be very distinctive, like this, right? You have the plant name in whatever language, and you have the species name. You would have the virus name in whatever language, English, Portuguese, Spanish, German, Russian, Hindi, Mandarin, and you would have the species name, okay? And the idea is that would be just like any other taxonomy. The first word is the genus name, the second word is the species epithet, okay, that you would devise. So why were this criticized? People would say, well, I have to learn Latin. I don't want to learn Latin. Oh, we can't devise all these names. I can't memorize all these names. These were very common criticisms that we used to hear all the time. And I was baffled at those criticisms because we have 9,000 bird species, 28 species of orchids, 400,000 species of beetles, all with Latin binomial names, species names. And I don't think that any entomologist memorizes 400,000. Of course not. You just know the names of the species that you work on. And maybe your colleagues work on, right? And for the other names, you just go to some source and, and you look at the name of the species, right? Same things with birds and orchids and any other organisms. And of course, you don't have to learn Latin. I don't speak Latin, I never will. But it's not difficult to devise the names based on simple rules. Like ornithologists and or, or people who study orchids <laughs> and entomologists devise new names for their new species. And they, don't, they don't speak Latin, right? So mostly people are, you know, satisfied. And, and that's especially true with the plant virologists. One criticism that I used to hear a lot from, from plant virologists is that, oh, well, our system works. Why change something that's working? It's too much, you know, all this hassle and everything. And, and, and it is true. It's, this is a fair criticism that as far as plant viruses are concerned, there was no demand. There was no, the, the community didn't ask for that. That's, that is true. I, I agree with that. Uh, a colleague of mine who works on tospel viruses said that this was an, elegant solution to a known problem. I like that, point, right? But go outside plant virologists and it was chaos, like with prokaryote virus names. It was the disaster and with animal virus names. So this was more of a demand that came from the animal and the prokaryote virologists than the plant virologists. But of course, we need a system for everyone, right? Not for just a few groups. So there was a formal, as I said, we submitted that as a proposal in 2019. But in the 2019 EC meeting, there was no consensus and the proposal was not voted. It was, it was, uh, what's the word, my God? It was deferred to the next meeting because we felt that we needed more feedback from the community. 
So this, uh, this paper was published in Archives of Virology in October of 2020, asking the community for feedback. And we got a lot of feedback. And the, from, from the plant virology community, it was mostly negative, okay? But when you take all virology, all virologists combined, it was mostly positive. And, uh, plant virology was an exception there. Uh, so uh, it was just extremely unfortunate that during 2020 we had the pandemic. And because all of a sudden virus taxonomy had this visibility that it never had before, and things like virus names were being discussed in, in the lay press. All of a sudden, is this, this whole thing was picked up by the lay press or, or by Nature or, 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 or this uh, general science uh, uh, magazines. And, but it was like this, this, this uh, uh, piece that was published in Nature grossly misrepresented how the process was being conducted. Because if you, if you read this, or if you, if you get curious and go read this, it, you get the impression that this was proposed by the first, for the first time during 2020. And I just showed you that this was initially proposed in 2016, and it had been discussed before many times since 2016. Uh, 2020 was the year when we had to make a decision, right? And so there was all these things about, oh, should we do, 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 And again, this was about species names, not virus names. So it was unfortunate, it was, but it was misrepresented, in fact, right? Anyway, uh, it was approved, okay? That's the big news. Uh, it was ratified on March 5th. So two interesting things here. What was eventually approved, was a free form species epithet. So you could have something like uh, lentivirus HIV, that could be a species name. Or you could have Tombus virus 123, that could be a species name, right? Or you could have a true Latin binomial. So it, it was, what was approved was a free form species epithet, right? But personally, I hope that most people will realize that what makes more sense is a truly linear binomial. And it was decided to wait, to, to give three years for study groups to change all current species names. So it doesn't have to be done right now. I have two years to come up with the new names, new species names, right? So as I said, this is so high profile these days. It's surreal that to, to have virus taxonomy being discussed in the lay press. And here in Brazil, there's this, this, this magazine. That's it. This is just a, a, a general knowledge magazine. It published this, this article a couple of months ago about the new virus nomenclature. And I, I, they consulted me to, to suggest a few of the names that could be eventually could be adopted, right? So flavivirus dengue or flavivirus Zika or better coronavirus SARS, who knows, right? So anyway, uh, it, and, and, and this was published uh, uh, here in September 2020, longer ago. So anyway, this is official now, okay? And uh, study groups who have two years to come up with these new species names. And I know that a lot of people are gonna be unhappy about that and I'm, I'm gonna get hate mail about that, but. Hey, uh, as I said, it's the work of taxonomy, right? You don't make any money, you work voluntarily at night on weekends and you get criticized all the time. As you see, it's true. And, and I think that's it, that's my last slide. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish here with the image of our campus. Thank you very much. And as I said, I hope I made it interesting. Thank you, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Murillo. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, you brought a thorough timeline and also the controversies that surround the virus yeah. taxonomy. And uh, we have questions here in the chat, so I'll read them to you if it, that's okay, and we can discuss them together. Okay. So um, I have a question to begin with. Okay. So you explained about viruses that, um, that were described based on metagenomics. Uh, like metagenomics, metagenomics only, like without any mm -hmm. host, like the host is unknown. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering like if someone wants to study a specific virus in terms of ecology, like how do you think uh, metagenomics can facilitate that? Because it's actually a pool of hosts, right? And then they ex extract, if I can say it right. 
that depends a lot. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. No, just um, that's a question. Like, how yeah. can it facilitate, and how the approach can be done? Well, it depends a lot on what you're sampling, right? Uh, with viruses, a lot of these metagenomic studies were done using uh, certain animals that are in the top of the food chain, in their respective food chains. So, for example, uh, dragonflies, in terms of insects, dragon dragonflies eat other insects. So, metagenomics of dragonflies this is a big topic in virology these days, because you find all these different viruses that probably infect other insects that the, the dragonfly is eating, right? You find, you find plant viruses as well, because of course, some of these insects are associated with plants. Uh, it's also very common to do metagenomics of uh, uh, water from, from lakes or of the oceans or sewage. Uh, so if you want to study ecology, you have to, first of all, think about uh, what kind of sampling you're going to do, right? And, and depending on your type of sampling, you're going to find different things. Right? Uh, and of course, as I said, you, you can't establish host relationships. You, you, you just can't. But a lot of times these days, you can establish good taxonomic relationships because what you find is related to something else that was found before in, in, a, in a known host. So you can make associations. Right? There's a lot that can be done. Okay, thanks. Um, there is a question by Dr. Valancourt on the chat, and she asks, how fast do viruses mutate and evolve in comparison with other organisms? And another question related to that is, how does the, that impact the diversity that is observed in metagenomics? It's a great question. Uh, in general, viruses have very high mutation rates. RNA viruses are extremely fast evolving in terms of mutation rates. Uh, Single-stranded DNA viruses also have very high mutation rates equivalent to RNA viruses. So if you think about plant viruses that are either RNA or single-stranded DNA, in general, they evolve very fast, much faster than their hosts. Now, a, a counterpoint to that is that usually they are under strong purifying selection. So that, that puts a little bit of a break in terms of how fast they can actually evolve. They have very high mutation rates, but their nucleotide substitution rates are actually a little, a little uh, lower, but still faster than their hosts. So yeah, they have a tendency to evolve very fast. They also recombine a lot. There's a lot of recombination in both RNA and single-stranded DNA viruses. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, I, I started going on a tangent on, on, on virus evolution. Oh, how does that impact the diversity? Uh, well, in incredibly, uh, it impacts a lot. And, and one thing that one, one, of, one of those quality criteria that I mentioned before, but didn't detail in terms of establishing taxonomy based on metagenomic sequences is to have enough depth on the sequence to make sure that the variation that you're seeing is real, not as a result of sequence mistakes or everything. Because when you sequence these viruses, you usually have a lot of variability and you have to make sure that the variability is real. And that, that it's not that re that easy sometimes. Thank you. We also have a question from Caleb on the chat, and he's asking: uh, Given that viruses may contain sequences from cellular organisms, does this complicate the metagenomic approach, or does it actually provide some assistance in taxonomic ranking? Given that it may aid in the challenge of viral evolution knowledge. Great, great. I like this question a lot. And, and, and you pointed out one of those, one of the problems, okay? One of the limitations, that, let's not call it a problem. Let's call it a limitation of uh, using metagenomic sequence for taxons. Sometimes you won't be able to, to actually come up with a, 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 a sequence, a, a genome, an assembly, <laughs> sorry, an assembly that's, uh, uh, that you have enough confidence on because you have these problems with host sequences. It's, it's a real problem sometimes. Uh, so uh, in some cases, you just have to generate more data. And, and in some cases, you have to go after the biological data. It's, it, it's not possible. To, you, 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 you just don't have enough confidence in the assembly to classify. It, it's definitely a limitation, OK? Uh, I, I can mention another 
limitation of metagenomics. Sometimes you just cannot assemble a, a, a complete genome for viruses that have multi-partite genomes. Okay, so we, and that's very common with plant viruses, uh, viruses with tripartite genomes or, or five components or sometimes eight components. So with the current tools that we have, sometimes it's impossible to, to be confident about the assembly. Now, one possible solution for that is when we have those third generation technologies like nanopore, Oxford nanopore, uh, uh, with the error rate that's low enough that you can get long reads and then you can assemble, be, be more confident in the assembly. Today, they still have very high error rates, so they cannot really use those technologies. So yeah, I, I don't want to give you the impression that you can always classify metagenomic sequences. I, 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 I said a, a number of times that you have to satisfy some quality criteria, and those are a few of them, OK? Uh, I see that he has another question, right? Do you think that yes. software may be useful in the conversion of current virus names to Linnean binomials? Uh, I suppose you could devise an algorithm to, to come up with Latin binomials or Linnean binomials, not necessarily to, con well, when you say convert, uh, gives me the impression that you're meaning translate. And, and that's, uh, maybe that's not what you're saying, right? Not translating, uh, but coming up, devising new names, yeah, maybe software could help, but you would you would have a human. You you would need a human to double check everything to make sure that the names make sense, right? But as I said, it's it, it sounds like a lot of work, but if you think about uh, uh, six six thousand species, and as I mentioned, there's about six hundred people involved in all the ICTV study groups. So on average. Each ICTV member would have to come up with 10 names. I can probably do this in 10 minutes, all right? So it's, it's going to be a lot easier than people think. It's just that people have never actually stopped and tried to do it. When they do, when they stop and try to do it, it's, oh, that was easy, <laughs> you know? Uh, but yeah, software could help, definitely. And speaking of software and nomenclature, uh, Dr. Nagy commented here on the chat also. He said, it would be interesting how to name new rec recombinant viruses among vastly different viruses. Yeah, well, I don't of know course. actually if it's a question. Um, well, it, it, it's a comment that I completely agree yeah. on. Of course, uh, it takes a virologist to, to criticize, to, to, to do a, a good criticism like that. Because it's true, again, that a sequence-based taxonomy, you always have the risk of making mistakes because of recombination, right? You have to be extra careful. Uh, in, in, in many cases, and I work with Gemini viruses, and, and Gemini viruses are extremely recombinogenic. So we're, we're sort of used to be extra careful when, when actually uh, identifying what we think is a new species and do everything we can to make sure it's if it's a recombinant, uh, to see if it's actually a new species or maybe a strain of a, of a known species. Uh, and, and the biology helps in those cases. So again, uh, a sequence-based taxonomy is allowed, is, 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 is accepted today, but always with this quality criteria in mind. And, and recombination is definitely a complicating factor there. Absolutely. Okay, so I think it's over. If anyone has any question, uh, please feel free. I think it's okay to email Dr. Zerbini. Of course. Because yeah. we're finishing like it's past the time, past four. So mm -hmm. I think we can finish here. And I thank you very much again for coming today and thank giving you. this wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you everybody. Obrigado. <laughs> De nada, Renata. Até a próxima. Até. Tchau. Hello. Uh, I mean, <laughs> sorry. See you all. Bye. <laughs> nice day. Bye. Very good. Bye bye. Have a nice day, everyone. You too.